uh, our actuarial science program is very strong here and it's an area we want to invest in and hockey and sports statistics in general is a very interesting application of it. So with that, I'll turn the mic over to Albert Cohen, who will introduce our speakers for today. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Duxbury. So it's uh, an absolute pleasure to work with all the eager, bright young minds on campus. And um, part of that development has been connecting with folks that are in actuarial science, but also in mechanical engineering and athletics. And so today's talk is an outgrowth, a very organic one of discussions that I had with one of my students, a gentleman named Trevor, who when I was teaching him in a engineering statistics class, came out to me and said, oh, Albert, you're Canadian, so am I. And by the way, I play on the hockey team. And I let him know that I'm a Vancouver Canucks fan. And at that time, the Canucks were in the 2011 series against the Blackhawks, and we were up 3 nothing in the series. And he had said, Albert's in the bag, they're gonna win it. And man, I had seen them lose so many times before. I appreciated his optimism, which is something that I've, as I've gotten to know him, is definitely part of his makeup. So 3-1, 3-2, 3-3, tied in the series after being up 3 nothing, the Canucks finally make it to the next round by beating the Blackhawks in game seven in overtime. And I'm on cloud nine. I come back to teach the class the next day. And Trevor shakes my hand and said, Albert, I knew you were going to do it. And I said, I didn't do it. They did. Um, by the way, the last time they did, do you know who scored the goal in overtime to beat the Chicago Blackhawks back in 82? Trevor said, I have no idea. And I said, well, Trevor, it was your dad, Jim Nill, who, if you're a Detroit Red Wings fan, uh, you'll know is the assistant general manager who's now gone on to be the general manager of the Dallas Stars, who, of course, went to the 2020 Stanley Cup Finals and had a fantastic showing. So um, as we got to know each other further after that, that, uh, that sort of small world story there, um, I would keep in touch with Trevor often and just ask how he's doing. Um, as he, you know, he was a draft pick of the St. Louis Blues and um, he eventually went to work in mechanical engineering, which is what he was trained as uh, in what was trained in here. And we would always talk about hockey analytics and just talk about what's been going on um, and what we could do. And, at one point, I just threw down the gauntlet and said, Trevor, uh, let's put all of our questions aside. Let's just get into doing this. Because I know that Trevor is somebody that likes to work with young people. Um, if you look at his work when he was an athlete and student on campus with Spartan Buddies, connecting athletes with uh, young children in the hospital, I know that he's a humanitarian at heart. He's somebody that loves people. But beyond that, he's somebody that's also interested in connecting with young minds. Um, and so what we did is we started to work on this actuarial course called Math 491 b which is a teamwork and communications course. And we developed basically curriculum from the ground up and how do we actually analyze problems in sports analytics, specifically hockey. Um, and as you can tell, by the way, I'm wearing the 1982 jersey right now in honor of uh, Mr. Nil. <laughs> and uh, so we talk about it and we're both fans of the sport and we were both also quantitatively trained and we wanted to have those two things converge. And, you know, we, I think we did something that was really groundbreaking, which is we involved undergraduates. You know, this is something you would imagine to be a graduate level analysis with all the data science behind it, but it wasn't. It was something that was organically grown with the help of undergraduates and every single alumni that's done work with us is part of the foundation of what you're gonna to see today. And so today, Brad Behan will be presenting his work. He's now also an alumni. He's out in Boston working his master's in sports management. Um, Brad will be talking about uh, the work that's been done in the spring, but also with Trevor, a nice general overview and entry level introduction to hockey analytics. So with that, let me turn it over to Trevor. Appreciate the, uh, the intro and the kind words, Albert, and uh, to expand on that a little bit, uh, you know, with most of our conversations, I was kind of the proverbial Grinch, Albert would come and say, oh, look at this paper. I said, ah, it's not going to work because of this, this, and this. And uh, it was, uh, always fun conversations and, and he's right. He, he threw on the gauntlet and said, fine, if it's not going to work, what will work? And then we started throwing some ideas out. So uh, very good intro. Appreciate the, uh, the kind words and introduction for Brad and I. Brad, if you want to go ahead and start sharing your screen. Um, so we're going to start laying some groundwork. We don't anticipate everyone on the phone today has a, uh, a PhD in hockey and that's okay. We're going to give you a, a quick overview. Uh, we worked with a, uh, uh, got some permission from actually a YouTuber um, who, who does kind of quick introduction videos to kind of give a, a general overview of the sport. Uh, so we'll watch that real quick. It's real short, about two minutes and 30 seconds here. And then we'll, uh, we'll jump into some of the, the challenges we see 
um, some of the issues we see with, with going through the sports. And then Brad can kind of go through one of the, uh, the options we've, we've started to look at to actually analyze uh, some of the numbers we have. So with that, Brad, if you want to go ahead and start that video, uh, we'll start there. Orange disc of rubber completely across the goal line and into the goal. If the puck doesn't cross the line, it doesn't count. The ice surface is 200 feet by 85 feet in North America and 60 meters by 30 meters internationally. The game starts with a face off, where the puck is dropped between two opposing players at center ice. A face off is used to restart play and can happen at one of the eight other face off dots on the ice. Ice hockey is played with two teams of 20, with six players on the ice at any one time. They consist of three forwards, two defenders, and one goalie. There's an unlimited amount of substitutions in this game, and they can happen at any time. The game is played in three 20-minute periods for a total playing time of 60 minutes. High score at the end of time wins. It sounds easy enough to understand, and it's the most simplistic way of looking at it, but ice hockey is filled with things that you can and cannot do. And should you break one of these rules, you will serve a time penalty, leaving your team with one less player and your opponents with a man advantage. The team with the man advantage is on the power play, and this makes it easier to score a goal as there is one less player to defend the net. The team with the man in the penalty box is on the penalty kill, and usually they defend like crazy until the time of the penalty expires. The length of time of penalty depends on the infraction made. These minor infractions result in two minute minor penalties. When a goal is scored by a team on the power play, the penalty time is cut short, and the player is let out of the penalty box. These major infractions result in five-minute major penalties. Unlike minor penalties, a major penalty has to be served in full, even if the other team scores. And these misconduct infractions result in 10-minute misconduct penalties. As with a major penalty, the player has to serve the full 10 minutes in full, even if the other team scores. There is one other infraction, the game misconduct, which results in a player being ejected from the entire game. There's a few other rules you'll need to understand before going to a game. For example, penalty shots. A penalty shot is awarded to a player if they've been obstructed before they can shoot. The shooter will start from center ice and try and score against the defending goalie. Only one shot is allowed, so the shooter must make it count. Offside. The puck must completely cross your opponent's blue line before any other players on your team. If a player crosses the blue line before the puck, it's offside and results in a face-off in your end of the ice. This is to prevent you keeping players in front of the opposing goalie for the entire game. Icing. Icing is where you shoot the puck across two red lines, the red center line and your opponent's goal line. If you are caught icing, this will result in a face-off being taken at your end of the ice. This rule is to prevent teams from just dumping the puck and making it a boring game. All right, it's perfect. Thanks for uh, setting that up, Brad. So very quick overview, like I said, it's... Uh, we don't expect everyone to have full knowledge of the game, but hopefully uh, that's a, a quick overview and a, a quick uh, update of the sport. If I had to compare it to a, uh, another sport that's similar, I, I would say soccer is, uh, is pretty similar in its, uh, in its basis to, to hockey. Um, so now let's start looking at, at some of the stats. So there's three main categories here when you're, when you're talking about scoring. You have your goals. That's where they talked about where the puck crosses the, uh, the goal line. Uh, and then you have assists. Um, which is where you help set up that goal. And we have um, primary and secondary assists in, in hockey. So uh, primary is you were the last player to touch and, and pass that puck to the player. Uh, secondary is you were, you were one step before that. So um, that's the main basis behind overall points. Um, you also have subcategories in there. They talked about penalties. So you have your even strength, your power play, and your shorthanded goals as well. Uh, and then plus minus is, is a goal differential. So if you're on the ice uh, during an even strength situation and your team scores, scores a goal, that's a plus for you. Uh, on the other side, if, if you're on the ice and a goal is scored against your team, that is a minus for you. So uh, when we start talking about analytics and other sports, uh, I'll, I'll say the gold standard is, is always going to be baseball. Um, Moneyball, uh, the movie, um, Brad Pitt, I believe, played Billy Bean as a great example of this. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's a, it's a kind of a neat movie to watch and understand how they came about. But baseball is a sport where 
everything is fairly well defined. It's all uh, standard. You either got a hit or you did not. You made it to first, second, third base, home run. It was a catch. It wasn't a catch. The only somewhat subjective part of the game is an error. Um, and that doesn't happen a whole lot. So it's very easy to get accurate stats uh, out of that sport. Uh, basketball, uh, you have shooting percentages uh, and locations. There's, there's more dynamics involved in it. But um, since that's such a key metric, uh, it's a little easier to get stats out of that. Uh, I would say football, um, you have very defined plays. The, the play is always starting uh, at a certain location. You know where that location is. Uh, the plays rarely last longer than 30 seconds. And in, in, in general, you see a very old school approach in football. So these are some other sports and, and some of the challenges um, we'll start talking about with hockey, but um, a little easier to get stats in other sports and to start breaking it down uh, if they want to see it. And, and with hockey, if you want to go to the next slide, um, we start looking at, some of the reasons we have issues. So if you look at uh, subjective stats, um, you know, hitting is, is a part of the sport. And sometimes that hit is to uh, be a strategy for the game where you're, you're trying to wear down the opponent. Sometimes it's to, you know, hit the opponent, take the puck away from them and, and go the other way. Um, Brad's going to talk later about controlled entry. So uh, there's different scenarios when you, when you throw a puck into the opposing team zone uh, was that a controlled entry is what was the reasoning behind that was that a, a player change you're tired uh, or was it you know a strategic where you're going to throw it in there and then go hit the def defenseman and make them think twice about going back to get that puck there's a lot of different strategies involved so you you start talking subjective and different people will have different opinions on what that stat means and when you have differing opinions uh, and you start looking at the numbers, try to analyze the numbers, it can make it very difficult. Uh, another reason why analytics in hockey is very difficult, it's a very dynamic game. Uh, soccer, I, I said it was a very similar sport, also struggles with this. Um, one reason why hockey really struggles, it's you can have live player changes. So you'll see people hopping on and off the bench uh, all the time. You can go five to 10 minutes in a game without a, stoppage in play in in that time you've had 20 to 30 player changes you have to keep track of all those players and, and we don't really have the technology or the means to um, track that accurately as as we want to um, some other reasons why it's a small puck it's four inches in diameter uh, the the current definition of cameras and, and tracking it uh, sometimes can lose that. You also have to think that the puck is being obscured by pads, players, sticks, and the camera very easily loses that object. Um, it's an indoor playing surface, so different lighting conditions and different rinks uh, can give you different, basically, outcomes of, of a game if you're using automated tracking. And then you have lots of obstructions in general in the rink. You've got fans standing up, You've got the board, so if the puck is on the, we'll say the near side, the, the puck will have to be obscured from a camera unless you have a direct overhead view. There's just a, a, a lot of challenges in, in getting accurate data that then you can analyze. So um, these are things that I constantly challenge, uh, you know, the students on and, and, and things we consistently have uh, uh, talks about. There's many, many more challenges, but those are those are some of the key ones. So what are the ways that we can start to overcome these challenges? And we'll start off with just, I would say technology in general. Uh, we talked about cameras, we're getting more high definition cameras uh, with 4K video. Sensors are becoming smaller, uh, more durable, better equipped, and we can start equipping uh, pucks, players, whatever it may be with sensors to start tracking this. And then also just computational power. So GPU processing is starting to increase dramatically and we're going to be able to process um, basically the base stats easier because we'll be able to track things more effectively in video. Uh, another thing we can look at is, is data error checking. So let's say, you know, right now we do have data that's coming in that might have errors. We can look at the, you know, quick and, and reliable ways to take this data and say, okay, do we have an error here? Are, are there discrepancies? Was that actually a hit? Was it not a hit? Um, I say quick and reliable, those that, that work in, in data and error checking usually know that quick and reliable don't go together. 
uh, in this sport. It has to be quick. You need to have quick turnarounds, but it also needs to be reliable. So uh, still more to go there, but that's something that, that we can continue to work on to uh, make sure that the data we do have is accurate. And then the last one, and this is something that, you know, we've been working a lot on uh, in, in the past, I'd say two to three years is what are different methods we can use to analyze? And that's what Brad's going to start to go through. You know, we've got one example here of, of a different method, a different look at how we can analyze the stats and, and break it out. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, um, to Brad. Uh, I'll say a, a note here real quick, write down this guy's name. He's got, uh, big things coming for him. He's, he's really, passionate for this and uh it's been a real excitement to work with him so brad take it away thank you trevor for those nice words i, I appreciate it um so jumping right into it some of the advanced stats so as trevor mentioned earlier uh controlled entries so uh this is an entry into an off into the offensive zone wall of control of the puck uh most commonly it's known with carry and entry so you're physically carrying the puck into the zone on your stick um, but pass entries have also been um uh, put into this category as well um, as the team is in solid control of the puck. And the other one is uncontrolled entry. So this is when basically a dump entry. So, um, and to prevent icing, the player must travel past to the red line, the center ice to dump the puck in the zone. And this, there's several ways to deploy this method. Um, you can do the dump and chase, which means you dump the puck into the zone. Say there's a couple guys on you, you want to make some space so you can uh, making his own entry, you dump the puck off the boards, and then you go and chase the puck to try and recover it. The second being a line change. So if your players are tired and you finally got possession of the puck, uh, you want to get some fresh legs, you can travel to center ice and dump the puck in the zone, get a full line change, get your new players on the ice. The third, dump into the honeypot area. So this is actually not a uh, area on the ice that is not marked with um, lines or paint. Uh, it's this area here in the corners uh, with the black uh, markings here. Basically, if you dump the puck into this area, the goalie cannot go out of his net and, and, uh, and take the puck. And it's very difficult for the opposing defenseman to fight off the, your four checkers to maintain possession. Um, so that's another method. And then the last being dumping around the rim of the board. So if you want to make it very difficult for the opponent to uh, acquire the puck, you can chip it off the boards or um, rim it. So preferably off the glass to prevent the goalie from coming out of his net into the trapezoid area to uh, turn it, um, to take it away. And you'd usually have a winger on the hash marks right here to re retrieve the puck. So that's uncontrolled entries. And then on the, on the flip side of it, you have controlled or uncontrolled exits. So it's the same logic as before, except when uh, instead of attempting to enter the offensive zone, you're attempting to exit your own defensive zone. And so with controlled exits, it's a simple carry out or pass out. And then uncontrolled exits are, again, dump outs. Uh, the more successful ones that, in my personal opinion, are controlled exits because you have a controlled breakout and you're not just trying to flip the puck out of the zone. If you dump the puck out of the zone, it could lead to a turnover and then the opposing team is just bearing down on you again. So some of the advanced statistics, uh, more advanced, I should say, um, the first being Corsi. It was developed by former Buffalo Sabres head co uh, goalie coach, Jim Corsi. It is defined as a sum of any shot attempt directed at the goal. So shots on goal, missed shots, and block shots. Um, it's usually uh, measured in terms of Corsi 4, so 4 meaning your team, Corsi against the opponent team, and Corsi 4 percentage basically in comparison to both teams how well, how well did your team do against the opponent team's Corsi 4? Um, and basically, it's used to de uh, determine how good a player is at generating shot volume for their team, preventing shot volume against, and controlling possession. The next is Fenwick. This is basically a modified version of Corsi. It's dubbed the unblocked shot attempts by the NHL. It's the same calculation as Corsi, except blocked shots are, re are excluded. Um, so it's Fenwick equals shots on goal plus missed shots. The next one is PDO. It doesn't actually stand for anything. It uh, was developed uh, by a guy with the pseudonym of Vic Ferrari on a hockey forms page. And it adds a team shooting percentage and goalie save percentages together at five on five strength. Now, five on five strength is the best strength to evaluate players because it's even. There's not a power play or an un, you know, a manpower advantage. Um, so in, in hockey analytics, you'll see a lot of articles that go over five on five strength, and that's the best way to evaluate players. 
Um, it's noted by the NHL as shooting plus save percentage and represents a frequency a team scores on one of its shots and the frequency of saves made by its goalie. Um, so that, that, that's uh, percentages added together. Um, not the best metric, but I still, still think a pretty good uh, basic introductory level advanced stat. Now here we're getting to super advanced stuff. So it's called uh, expected goals or XG. It takes Corsi and assigns a weight to each shot attempt. And this also, as it's <laughs> expected goals, and of course with a picture down there, it takes the location of the shot, the shot type, and the shot speed. Now the wrist shot is the most accurate and most used shot in the NHL today. Um, slap shots are good for positional play, like on the power play. Same thing with tips and deflections. And then backhands are more of a, a skilled move nowadays. Um, Shot speed is also a very important. Uh, if you have Zdeno Chara, uh, the 6'8 defenseman for the Boston Bruins, who at one point of his career had a 108 mile an hour slap shot, the fastest in the league history, um, you'd want him to be taking slap shots from certain certain locations. And um, odds are that's probably going to go in if he has uh, if he has an accurate on target shot. So um, all of those, of course, are important into the calculation. It's usually measured in terms of XG4 or XGF, XG against or XGA and XG4 percentage. It's uh, like I mentioned, used to determine how good a player is at generating shot quality for their team and preventing shot quality against. And uh, this is very similar. Uh, soccer actually uses the same metric. So this is actually a soccer field here. And uh, you can see the darker the color, the higher percentage of scoring um, you are from that position. And um, it's very similar like this in hockey. So from that, moving on to what we did in the springs, uh, last spring semester with our player prediction project. Uh, but first I'd like to just acknowledge my fellow group mates, uh, Derek Lasker, Abe Rucker, and Zach uh, Veltevin. Uh, we did a great project together and, and uh, they're great guys. So um, I'd like to just first thank them for all their hard work on this project as well. Um, so the goal of this project was to use linear regression to estimate player performance over the first three seasons of their NHL careers using their junior data. And so there's plenty of restrictions in this uh, that we put on the data set to make it the best uh, prediction possible. But the main important ones were that we limited it to forwards who played in the Canadian Hockey League system. So if you're not familiar, the Canadian Hockey League is a actually conglomerate of three junior leagues across Canada. And these include the Ontario Hockey League or the OHL, the Western Hockey League or the WHL, and the Quebec Major Junior League, or uh, we just sometimes refer to it as the Q. And so from the plot here, we can see that the majority of the players uh, or from the OHL and that is not by design. That is just how the restrictions and the coming through hundreds and hundreds of players uh, came up with. Um, further of the play, uh, data restrictions are outlined in our report, um, which we'll get to later. So we wanted to use a data analysis technique to sort of look at the data and, and sort of what, what are we dealing with here? So the best uh, you know, I, uh, method that we thought of at the time, um, it was principal component analysis or PCA. And so as defined by DataCamp, it is a linear transformation on a given data set that has values for a certain number of variables or coordinates for a certain amount of spaces. And basically this is very good for large data sets. It changes the data into a, a 2D figure, 3D, you can, uh, you can also do this in three dimensional and to sort of decipher, helps deciphering, you know, what are the most variable uh, components. And so with that, principal components are the underlying structure of the data and uh, directions where there's most, the most variance. And just to piggyback off that, the transformation fits the data to a new coordinate system where the most significant variance is always found in the first coordinate. And this is always true. It doesn't matter if you have, I don't know, 15 components, the first one always has the highest uh, variability. Um, each subsequent coordinate is orthogonal to the last and has a lesser variance. And these all sum to 100%. And so with that, uh, this is what was our uh, PCA plot. So just to set, uh, set the stage for you, the uh, more light blue the color, the more years that that player played in their respective junior league, and the darker the color, uh, the fewer years. Um, so we can see here that the first component, which is composed of 40% of the variability, uh, is highly correlated with the players who spent three or four years in their respective junior league. And this is this makes perfect sense because uh, the aggregate statistic uh, directions are all pointing in that direction too. So, I mean, and logically speaking, the more games you play, the more points you should accumulate. And so that is uh, perfect in the case of these players, especially John Tavares, who is a current superstar with the Toronto Maple Leafs and was a former first overall pick by the New York Islanders. Um, he played four seasons with the uh, Oshawa Generals and London Knights. 
and put up ridiculous numbers with them, um, very high scoring. So this makes uh, logical sense as well as mathematical sense. Uh, and then you can see here on the second component, which is 19.18% of the variability, the rate statistics like uh, even strength points per game, uh, points per game, um, power play points per game are all correlated, or not all, but generally pointing in the direction of players who played very few seasons in their respective junior league. Um, Sidney Crosby is a former first overall pick. He plays with the Pittsburgh Penguins. He played two seasons with the, uh, with the Quebec Major Junior League's Ramuski Oceanic, and he put up over 100 points each season. Um, so it makes sort of sense that he is sort of to the left of the origin and sort of in the general, not general area, but in the relative area of as well as the, of the aggregate statistics, as well as the per rate statistics. Meanwhile, Patrick Kane, who played one season with the London Knights of the Ontario Hockey League, put up over 100 points and had a very high, very um, high rates. It makes sense that he is more over where the rest of the one the one year players are. Uh, one more quick example of this, uh, a kind of an odd example, is Patrice Bergeron. He played one season in the Quebec Major Junior League, putting up about 70-ish points in 60 games, which is very good. Um, he's more of a two-way player, so he's a good defensive player forward as well as a, a good forward uh, offensive producing player. Um, so it's rather interesting that he is sort of on the origin for the second component and very positive on the first. Um, so it's just a rather interesting uh, uh, development there. Yeah, Brad, if I could if I could step in here real quick on that one, if you want to head back to that graph real quick. You know, we haven't talked too much about this, but the, you know, most people think that if you're going to build a hockey team, you just want to go out and get the highest scores, who's going to put the most points up and, and do all this. And and as we look at this chart, and I'm really glad, glad you brought up the, the Patrice Bergeron two-way player. The, the game of hockey requires a lot of players who are not necessarily your superstars that are going to put up a lot of points, but good two-way players, good shutdown defensemen, good shutdown forwards who may not put up as many points, but they do a good job at, at, at stopping the uh, other team of uh, scoring as well while maintaining a, a decent plus minus rating. So what I like about this is you can kind of look and see individual players and how they contribute in their different ways and, and how that's, that adds to their overall impact. So just something I wanted to add in there. Thank you, Trevor, for pointing that out. Um, so moving on to our prediction methods. So we use multiple linear regression. Uh, we use several regressions over this project, but the one that produced the best results was backward stepwise. And if you're not familiar with backward stepwise, it, it, to sum it up, it basically takes the, takes all variables in your model and it, uh, it, it looks at all the P values. So it, it removes the highest P value, meaning the least significant predictor and until it gives you the best, uh, model. And that's what we got in this case. We got, um, the model found that assists, points per game, even strength assists, power play assists, plus minus, shorthanded points per game, and season two points were the best predictors. And this is rather fascinating because the season two points, um, if you're not familiar, the second season of any NHL player's career is the usually the hardest. Um, when you're a rookie, no one really knows who you are. You, know, you can sort of burst onto the scene, and uh, this, you know, no one's. It's going to be very hard to pick up on a player's um, playing ability in that first year. The second year they're going to be on to you. Um, they'll have video packages on you. They're going to have every asset of your game dissected. They'll know exactly what you're going to do. Um, so if a player can perform well in that second season, it's a very good, in, not a great indicator, but a good sign maybe that this player could be a, a, good, a good player for your organization long-term. And of course, the response variable in this was the uh, NHL data uh, points per game. And so with that, our, our regression achieved a 0.478 multiple R squared value, which is um, not great in statistical terms, but given the fact we had all these restrictions and, and on the data and it was very selective um, in that regard, I think this is a pretty good result. Um, our, we had a 0.15 sigma, basically the standard deviation. Uh, our, each prediction could be off by 0.15 up or down and a p-value of zero indicating its statistical significance. Um, in addition to uh, predicting our NHL players, our established NHL player points per game, we ran our model through with uh, through 166 NHL prospects uh, to sort of predict and maybe look in the future how they uh, how close they perform. So, um, here are our top 20 uh, players uh, that uh, on our list. Um, the uh, to give you some context, uh, Alexi Lafreniere was drafted first overall by the New York Rangers. He finished third on our list with a 0.72 predicted. Um, 
for all you Red Wing fans out there, Joey Valeno, uh, number 14 on our list, which is pretty good, 0.62. Um, any Leafs fans, Semyon uh is currently on loan with Torpedo Nizhny Novgorod of the KHL. Pretty good player. Should be uh, a lot of room to develop still, but should be pretty good. And then uh, a rather interesting one is Jan Yenik. He's a Czech forward currently playing, I believe, in Sweden with I.K. Oskarsham. Um, played in the OHL last year and the year before, but he put up uh, about a point per game average. And it's rather interesting that he's predicted so high above uh, a first overall pick who should be in the NHL. So it should be uh, interesting to see how these predictions hold up. Whoops. One interesting point on that too, uh, the Arizona Coyotes are the first team to really, I would say, uh, widespread and, and kind of completely form their organization around um, analytics. Their, their GM was, uh, I'm not going to say relatively new to the hockey world, but he, he was kind of a, a wild card pick and, and he heavily relies on data analytics. Uh, he's got to a lot of good ideas and it's been interesting to watch, uh, you know, how he's handled the team. So, you know, you can sit here and look and say, okay, did they have some numbers, uh, you know, on Jan when they, when they picked him? And that's why he's top of the list. I also know that the, the newest team joining the NHL, Seattle Kraken, uh, they have a, I think a data analyst uh, full-time on staff. So we're seeing this trend um, of a lot of teams starting to, to fully adapt this. Um, there's also a lot of teams that uh, still are taking my approach that are, okay, we're, we're not really into this yet. There's still a lot of questions that have to be answered. Uh, but uh, I, I think that the neat thing about this is we're, we're questioning things, but then also trying to find answers. So. Absolutely. So that is the end of our presentation. Uh, thank you very much for, for coming. And here's our QR code to our website where you can find our full report and, uh, some other projects that we are currently working on. So thank you. And we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have.